Corny, and I'm the director of the PhD program in nursing. Uh, this presentation is sponsored by the Lapis Library History Collections, the Department of Bioethics, and Interdisciplinary Studies. Now for this afternoon's presentation. We have Dr. Brita Lundgren, who's going to present the Swedish swine flu pandemic, mass vaccination, and the power of narratives. But first I want to tell you just a little bit about Dr. Lundgren. Dr. Brita Lundgren is a professor of, of ethnology and former dean of faculty of arts at Umeå University, Sweden. She has also worked as the director of their National Graduate School of Gender Studies. That was from 2001 to 2006. Her research and publications have been focused on gender studies and gender theory. In 2006, she released her book titled Unexpected Mourning, which is about how people deal with grief, particularly the grief that happens to a family when they have an unexpected death, like a, an accident. Uh, unfortunately, we were talking and she said that it's not been translated into English, and I thought it'd be wonderful for, you know, those in the health sciences and particularly nursing, you know, to how to deal with that. She has been at Umeo University for about 25 years. She enjoys dancing the Lindy Hop, reading fiction, and eating anything. And look at her. Because she does a Lindy Hop, she stays so nice and fit. So please welcome her this afternoon. And she's going to just help us draw the dots between, you know, she's got so many interests with the gender studies and then, and then these narratives. So she's going to. Uh, tell us how she she got here, and then from that point A to point B. So welcome, Dr. Lundgren. Uh, okay, thank you for this presentation, and thank you for mentioning the Lindy Hop because that, <laughs> I think that would be a very big, important part of my identity. <laughs> uh, and thank you for giving me the honor to speak tonight. And thank you to Andrea Kita. Where are you? <laughs> Uh, for just suggesting me to this lecture series. And I've looked through some of the previous presentations and there is surely a lot of interesting research going on and it's presented here. And of course I would also like to especially mention Andrea Kita's presentation and her very interesting book about vaccination and public concern in history because that was that was made me come here. I read it and it was a great inspiration and I'm now here at the ECU for two weeks to meet people and to talk here among other things. And as you already may have seen from the poster for the presentation there is a map of the Nordic countries in <coughs> uh, Sweden, Finland, Norway and Denmark. And I come from Umeå uh, which is situated in the northern part of Sweden by the coast. And Umeå is um, the European capital of culture, 2014. So if you have any plans to visit this part of Sweden, 2014 might be a good occasion to do it. We will be celebrating the whole year and Sami culture will be an important part of the cultural capital year. And there will be reindeer through the whole city, all of <laughs> inauguration at least. Uh, Umeå University is a fairly young university. We are celebrating our 50 year anniversary in 2015. And it is one of the six largest universities in Sweden and the number of students is about 34,000. And I'm a professor of ethnology as was said and in my research I have been working on several different topics. My doctoral dissertation in ancient time of 1990 <laughs> was about women working in the Swedish postal service and I was interested in the myths and stereotypes for this female occupation. Postmistresses, at least in Sweden, were considered to be very nasty and impolite and still they had quite important power positions in the local communities. And I've also been doing research about norms and culture of friendship and also about its opposite, hostility and the cultural processes of keeping animus for centuries. Maybe that is something you could know something about in this state, maybe. My latest book concerned trust and grief, uh, as was said. What happens when people face serious, fateful moments that changes life completely? And this was a project where my past 
part was to write about people losing someone in a sudden fatal accident and how do people face the cultural imperatives, the do's and don'ts in how to grieve in a supposedly right manner. I was interested to go beyond the psychological discourses about mourning practices and to see what people's lived experiences were. And that was, goes through my research all the time to get to people's lived experiences. And gender studies has been a theoretical inspiration throughout the years. And for five years, I have also headed a large interdisciplinary project called Challenging Gender with about 40 researchers from different scientific areas. And I would say, say that the experiences from the Challenging Gender project that also had very much on health and very much on emotions played an important part for me when I was, um, was um, using this subject. Although I have not decided yet on any theoretical, typical gender things, I, I, I reason in that way that we have to think, we have to see what the material gives uh, according to gender, rather than to say it in advance what it would be. Uh, after six years of administrative work and leadership duties as the Dean for the Faculty of Arts, I can now go into research again. And this field of pandemics and vaccination turned out to be the most interesting thing for me to do. So my project tonight, my presentation tonight is about this research project concerning the swine flu pandemic. And now the swine flu, as you might recall very well, started in April 2009 and with the initial warning from CDC Atlanta about two children in Southern California with febrile respiratory illness. Later it was shown that this new virus had already caused an epidemic in Mexico. It was shown that the virus in California and Mexico were identical and it was evident that it was a pandemic strain. It passed the WHO stage four and phase six was officially declared in June 2009. And at that, at that time, the European Center for Disease Control estimated that 74 countries worldwide were affected and 27,000 cases of influenza were reported, including 141 deaths. So why have I become interested in this particular case of swine flu? Because it was something that had many effects on Swedish society and maybe most of all the serious side effects from the vaccination with pandem risks that happened in Sweden. And the discussion that has followed about risks and vaccine safety and the importance of trust when it comes to pandemic preparedness and vaccine decisions. So to begin with, I want to show you two quotes that connect to something of what I'm going to talk about. And this is the first. We had a good worked out planning with the county councils and so on, and that was why we were so su successful. The whole Europe was wondering, how did you manage? So what would have turned out to be a success story became an Achilles heel when it was shown that the vaccine had such serious side effects. And the success that this official talks about is the process of decisions and actions following the official declaration from WHO that the world was facing the influenza pandemic. That was named the swine flu. All I know, although I know there has been protests to the naming and blaming from the pig industry throughout the world. <laughs> influenza vaccination has since the World War II been the most favored technical solution to protect people from flu, whether it's seasonal or pandemic. And the implied seriousness by the WHO decision to upgrade the swine flu to a pandemic made mass vaccination a rational choice for wealthy countries that had the critical infrastructure to do it. Although this was the case for many countries in Europe and the world, Sweden turned out to be the most successful country to implement a mass vaccination campaign in a timely and efficient manner with a relatively high uptake among the population, 60%. And Sweden was considered as a model, at least for Europe, for efficient planning and implementation. And Sweden has also a very successful history concerning vaccination practices and a very high uptake, around 99% for children's vaccinations programs. And the other quote I want to show you uh, to begin with comes from one of the young people having the vaccine pandemic and afterwards the serious side effect from the disease narcolepsy. And, and she, she says, I trusted them one shot and then my whole life was changed. In this newspaper article, this girl describes her daily sleeping attacks, several through the days, and her many cataplexes, that is losing muscle control, also several every day, that come when she experiences any kind of emotions, 
be it joy or worry or anger or something else. The official in the first quote talks about efficiency and pride turning into an Achilles heel. The girl talks about lost trust and a changed life. Both these slides point to upcoming problems, at least for Sweden, if we get into the same type of situation again with the pandemic flu and if we are in need of a mass vaccination strategy. Now, let's have a couple of words about influenza in general and influenza pandemics, some taken from American historian George Diener. There have been over 30 documented influenza pandemics since the first well-described pandemic in the 16th century. From the end of the 19th century, five influenza pandemics have impacted Sweden. The Russian flu, the Spanish flu, the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, the H and the H1N1 pandemic, the swine flu, this latest 2009-2010. So the history of influenza is long, but knowledge about the viral cause, the variability of the virus and the disease, the factors necessary for effective transmission and methods that can stop its spread is more recent and still incomplete. And Richard Neustadt and Harvey Feinberg have called influenza a slippery disease. You might recall George Ford here. <laughs> in, in their review of the circumstances around the decisions to mass vaccinate the US population in 1976 during an outbreak of the swine flu. And five features that combined to make influenza a slippery disease were, in their opinion, the change in character of influenza virus. It is a complex, constantly changing virus the lack of inf effectiveness of influenza vaccines, although Pandemrix turned out to be a very effective vaccine, that influenza symptoms are widely misunderstood, that influenza is not the only virus likely to give rise to influenza-like illness, and finally, that the multitude of causes of flu-like illness makes it difficult to estimate the year-to-year -year impact of the influenza virus on the public health. So influenza is definitely not a stable phenomenon. It affects society in many and complex ways. There is no clear solution how to deal with seasonal or pandemic influenza, not even an agreement on what the problem consists of. Is it mainly a public health problem, an economic problem, or a problem of national security and stability, or all of these equally? And is it a wicked problem? A wicked problem is a problem that is difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. And when a problem is socially complex with many interdependencies, is multi-causal and not the responsibility of a single institution, has no clear solution and is unstable, it is usually a wicked problem. The term wicked is used not in the sense of evil, but rather its resistance to resolution. It involves changing behavior and sometimes has a history of chronic policy failure. Moreover, the effort to solve one aspect of a wicked problem may reveal or create other problems. Influenza gives rise to epidemics on a smaller or greater scale every year. A pandemic is caused by a virus with a new genetic composition and a new antigenic setup not previously encountered by the global population. And this places special demands on preparedness for vaccine distribution. The influenza 2009 differed from what was expected. It carried an unexpected virus, started from an unexpected place of origin, and with the young and healthy people as pronounced at-risk group for being infected besides pregnant women, the obese and the chronically ill. And one of the first reports about the spring-summer cases 2009 was that the median age reported was 19 years and 78% of the reported cases younger than 30 years of age. Children from 5 to 19 years of age accounted for over 46%. And the swine flu pandemic was also different in other ways. And a report from the European Centre for Disease Control states that it was the first pandemic with instant communication so that early impressions, such as the experience as in, for instance, Mexico, could be shared ahead of proper scientific analysis. And it was the first pandemic with the blogosphere and other rapid communication tools that were impossible to ignore. And this makes the cultural perspective and the issue of narrative stories and other types of folklore, folklore very important. Folklore contains material that is mobile, manipulative and transcultural. 
and folklore material can pass from one culture to another, crossing geographical boundaries and linguistic barriers. So, uh, and of course, there is lots of medical and epidemiological research going on about influenza, about pandemics, and also about the rare disease narcolepsy. And as you know, I'm not a medical researcher, and I can't contribute anything at all to the biologically based medical knowledge, but I'm interested to see how the use of cultural perspective can have an impact on issues connected with epidemics, pandemics, and vaccination. And these could be knowledge about cultural perceptions, memories, experiences, emotions, and values, popular culture, and so on. As an ethnographer, I mainly use qualitative methods, and in my case, predominantly interviews. That is, I speak to people about their experiences, their thoughts, their fears, their trust, and mostly also their anger. Interviewing people, speaking to people, creates narratives and stories. And stories are important because they often work as people's selections and evaluation guidance systems. Stories and storytelling practices are important to consider to understand how people make choices, how they value information, and what they judge is the best way to decide about serious matters as health, illness, and disease. And I have started my field work only this year uh, by doing interviews with people from three different groups. And these are the groups. The one is the authorities, experts, researchers, policymakers. Another one is the patient groups, that is narcolepsy patients, but also the swine flu patients. And the third one is the health staff, doctors and nurses. But today I will mainly concentrate on the two first, where I've been doing most interviews. And I will give you some preliminary thoughts about results so far. And I would like to stress that they are preliminary, but still they can give a hint on what I mean by the power of narratives. Let me do this by describing some of the themes coming up from interviews with a group of officials, decision makers, policy makers, and afterwards I will include themes from the interviews with parents of children with narcolepsy. In spite of what was described as unexpected in this pandemic, Sweden in most respect was quite well prepared to meet the pandemic. And this is a very common narrative from the authorities. We were well prepared. National authorities had pandemic plans and all the county councils had some sort of pandemic planning. And it was an overarching organization to cover national and local levels. And its state of preparedness had very much been triggered by the outbreaks of avian flu and SARS earlier on. Sweden also had an advanced purchase agreement with a vaccine supplier, GlaxoSmithKline, that was to produce the pandemic later. And plans were in place for distributing stockpiles of antiviral drugs. And when the WHO upgraded the pandemic to phase six, the built-in trigger in this agreement was pulled on to call the agreement. We had been thinking about this for years, and this was interesting because the, the pandemic was one of the few things happening in the world where we actually were well prepared. And we had a very obvious rehearsal with the bird flu some years earlier. So we brought our plans and started the meetings. We did what we had said we would do. And there was a great reliance on the, on the state of preparedness but it's also well known that governments and authorities with the responsibility to protect, to protect people face double-edged fears in a situation like this. One is the fear of having done too little and afterwards be accused of having disregarded the threat and thereby causing unnecessary damage. The other fear is overreaction, crying wolf, and being accused of wasting money and trust. And as Swedish philosopher Christian Munte has argued, there is a constant play between the price of precaution and the price of carelessness. The price of precaution comes through the measures taken to diminish the price of carelessness. The less that is done to handle the pandemic, the more likely it is that the consequences will be bad, and the more that is done, the more likely it is that there will be damages through the measures of precaution. It's a dilemma. And one of the prices for precaution could be the unwanted side effects that can follow medical measures. 
and vaccines and medical products are perceived both as blessings and as threats. Several medical product scandals and scares have created suspicion and beliefs that politicians walk hand in hand with profit-gaining pharmaceutical companies. Another uh, important theme in the interviews is uh, the thinking about risk groups. A very concrete difficulty concerned how to judge who were at risk of being infected and who would be seriously ill or be at the risk of dying. And how should authorities communicate this? And in some ways the risk groups were different than had been the case in earlier pandemics. Here we had another panorama. Here we saw the young adults in their upper teens, healthy people who fell very ill. We saw them in ECMO and then the risk group sort of fails. Who are the risk groups? All in all, you had to vaccinate the young ones because they are the ones who spread the disease. And I don't know if you know, but this ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Very hard to say. <laughs> Uh, that young people were at risk of being infected also brought the worry that young people would not be particularly willing to be vaccinated. There were also worries about the vaccine supply. Would there be enough vaccine produced in time? The politicians decided quite early that no other solution was possible than to buy quantities that would made it, make it possible to vaccinate every Swedish individual with two doses of vaccine. Any other decision was regarded as ethically and politically, politically impossible. In this way, the vaccination decision in Sweden resembles the decision in the US in 1976. There was a strong wish and clear intention from Swedish politicians and health authorities to have as many as possible vaccinated. Nevertheless, some medical risk groups were prioritized together with healthcare workers to get the vaccination first. And the mass vaccination started in Sweden in mid-October 2009. People lined up at workplaces, at schools and health centers, uh, many, very many places, to get the vaccination. And there were several discussions going on in media about fears not to have the vaccine. Why is the vaccine never coming? Why isn't anything done? Why so slow? Remembers one official about reactions coming to the authorities. And of course, the lines started to be longer and the worry greater as soon as there came reports about deaths. In hindsight, one could also wonder about these lines. Maybe it was a very good time for the virus to spread, standing in long lines, coughing. Would, there also be one, would that also be one aspect, aspect of a wicked problem when solutions also create problems? And in some parts of the countries, up in the northern part where I live, there were also examples of vaccine parties. That is, people assembled for coffee and cake to have a, to have a chat and to have the shot at the same time. So it was, uh, people were primarily not hesitant to, to do this. By the end of November, around 60% of the population had been vaccinated, an unprecedented vaccination effort in Sweden. The result could be measured as both very satisfactory but also as a proof that Sweden had not reached completely the goals that were set. And one study that deals with why all Swedes did not take the vaccination states five different reasons. One is that people distinguish between unnecessary and necessary vaccination. People feel distrust towards the vaccination, although we don't have much anti-vaccination movements, we have some. And the idea of the natural is all, comes also along. Uh, people resist an exaggerated safety culture and also some people have injection fear. But maybe it was a problem that authorities tried to present two messages at the same time. One message was that it was a straightforward recommendation of getting the vaccine. And the other, a more underlying message, was that it was voluntary to vaccinate and the decision should be based on a personal choice and self-interest. So one could say that the governing ambitions were not quite clearly communicated, and I will re re return to this later on. And this is a picture about the coverage of vaccination from some different countries in the world. The vaccine pandemrix was used in 38 countries, but there were also other vaccines used. 
And here in the US, you had an, a vaccine without adjuvants. Van der Riks had a very strong adjuvants. And all the Nordic countries here have quite up, uptake, uh, quite high uptake, as you can see. One theme was also that we have a very big efficiency in the Swedish welfare system. And when it comes to resources and infrastructure, we had them. Uh, and we got a political decision quickly and in consensus. And also practical measures were taken. For example, that nurses could handle the vaccination, not only doctors. And one could also put forward something about Swedish culture being considered obedient and where governmental technologies have relied on people's obedience, on people's sense of responsibility and sense of trust. So, so far so good. The pandemic turned out to be milder than expected, and the only debate and criticism in late 2009 and 2010, early 2010, was about the costs for society. So this could have been the end of a success story in how to handle a pandemic influenza. We had the careful preparedness, we had the political decisions claiming vaccine for the whole population, we had a successful organization, and we had a high uptake. So all these factors could really have made a large difference if the pandemic would have turned out to be as severe as it as was feared from the beginning. And Sweden estimates that we had 30 people dying from swine flu and about 130 people in intensive care. So quite mild. Latest findings indicate that globally it can be estimated about 200,000 respiratory deaths and also um, about 83,000 cardiovascular deaths from the swine flu. And 80% were in people younger than 65 years. And over 50% occurred in Southeast Asia and Africa. <clears throat> so maybe the swine flu indeed was more severe than both science and general opinion has believed, at least on a global scale. But uh, from the summer of 2010, reports started coming to the Medical Project Products Agency about an unexpectedly large number of narcolepsy in children and adolescents after the vaccination with pandem rigs. And the incident cases of narcolepsy ha has since then risen to about 200 cases now. It depends on how you count. All in all, we have about 4,000 people in Sweden suffering from narcolepsy, and the normal incidence is about 1 per 100,000 per year. These are the so-called normal cases, not having to do with vaccination. So the results have provided strengthened evidence that the vaccination with pandem rigs for preventing the spread of swine flu was associated with a high risk for narcolepsy with cataplexy, uh, in children and adolescents 19 years and younger. And this serious medical side effect was unexpected and has gained significant importance for the public medical and authorities' opinion regarding epidemics and vaccines. And later research has also shown that there are high risks even for adults that are vaccinated. Sweden and Finland were the first countries to report this association with pandemics. But reports have then followed from England, from Ireland and Norway, and there are some signs of association even in France. Canada and Brazil used the vaccine very similar to pandemics, but no studies are completed yet. And when the reports about the narcolepsy <coughs> side effects started to be public, the first reaction from both authorities and the medical expertise was skepticism. It was really hard to believe that the vaccine could cause this unknown side effect of course, influenza vaccines had been used for 80 years without any similar side effects. And narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder that is caused by the brain's inability to regulate the cycles of sleep-wake normally. And people with narcolepsy often experience disturbed no nocturnal sleep and an abnormal daytime sleep pattern. They can fall asleep 20, 30, 40 times a day. One uh, of the many and hard problems that narcoleptic patients experience is cataplexy, a sudden muscular weakness often brought on by emotions of any kind. The disease is lifelong, and this far there is no cure beside different kinds of medication 
for sleeping disorder and some central sti stimulants medication. Amphetamine, for instance. Amphetamine. Uh, this kind of, these kinds of pictures with sleeping children, uh, and there have been quite many, constitute very strong narratives, and these are pictures hard to forget. Now, uh, of course, what goes on is a big discussion about why this happened. It has been called a mystery, an unknown medical mystery, a lottery, a conspiration. And the medical sciences discusses if part of the explanation is the virus infection itself, or if it is only the vaccination or a combination of these. Many studies point to the vaccines. Toxic and autoimmune mechanisms have been proposed. And there is also strong evidence for an underlying genetic disposition. And those are some of the medical causes that are discussed. In the interviews with the families where children have got narcolepsy, other more political, social or economic explanations are common in their telling of angry pathographies to suggest, for instance, insufficient testing of the vaccine. Um, the vaccine was tested very little on children um, I don't know if, it, it, if, it, if, it's, if it's normally, if, if uh, vaccines are tested on children. My, my question is, whose children should we have tested on in such a large scale? Or pharmaceutical companies wanting to make profits. This is a very common explanation. Authorities being too eager to test the pandemic preparedness. Exaggerated panic reactions regarding the pandemic. Swedish authorities being too obedient towards WHO. And people being stupidly obedient. Sweden had the worst scenario because we deserved it, people also say. And these explanations on different levels and from different viewpoints can be discussed with help from Dutch ethnographer and philosopher Anne-Marie Moll and her use of the concept multiple realities. Moll has studied the enactment of disease in med medical practice with arteriosclerosis as her example. That multiple realities are enacted can also be seen in the case of narcolepsy, not only in description of the disease, but also in how people perform different explanations for the disease. So now let's remember my slides in the beginning with the both um, quotations. The first one about uh, the trust that authorities initially had in their sufficient knowledge about how to act. We were well prepared. And the second from the young people suffering from narcolepsy. One shot and then my whole life was changed. Both remain important signs of a possible turning point regarding the public's historically deep trust in society's ability to take good measures when it comes to health and communicable disease prevention. But it, it's Important to note that one of the most commonly used arguments in the anti-vaccination movement, movement, and also when it comes to vaccination against the swine flu, is the fear of diseases like Guillain-Barré syndrome or other neurologi neurological diseases. And of course, it is a big difficulty now to pedagogically face the fact that narcolepsy really has been proven to be caused by vaccine pandemics in several countries. And although it is, it, if it is too early to know if the experiences with the side effect will endanger upcoming mass vaccination efforts, it is certainly clear that this experience has caused doubts and misbeliefs. References to solidarity or altruism are currently on the increase in public discourse when it comes to public health measures. Different countries emphasize the solidarity arguments to different degrees. In Sweden, the argument that vaccination during the pandemic was an act of solidarity, as well as in the self-interest of the individual, was prominent in the authorities' communications. This seemed natural, since solidarity has been a central value in Swedish healthcare. Several of the officials that I interviewed claimed the importance of the solidarity argument for reaching herd immunity, and for some also for ideological reasons. I think the argument holds. I think it's one of the best arguments for vaccination in society. And it is not only to protect other people. You don't know where you will end up next time. Maybe you are in the risk group yourself. So it's not only about solidarity. I think it is a rather fine argument, so to speak. Another official answers the question if Sweden exaggerated the argument. 
if we signal too strong or not, it's very hard to know. But I think that all the work with preventing contagious diseases and the work with public health has in itself a very strong element of solidarity. You do things even if you don't know that you yourself will benefit fit from it. And research has also shown that the argument of altruism could be regarded as a very important argument to put forward. Altruism, both seen as a psychological or a cultural trait, can influence human behavior and decision making. And many of the parents of narcoleptic children that are interviewed claim that the argument for solidarity was very important for their decision to accept the vaccine. Their reasoning was that it was important to have the vaccine, that all siblings should have it, and this would be a way to protect other people or other children who for different reasons could not take the vaccine. And this points to something of the double messages, messages mentioned earlier. Politicians and health authorities want citizens to be both autonomous and self-governing, to make their own choices, but they also want obedient citizens to follow intentions and instructions given from authorities. And quite many also feel that they were morally forced to vaccinate. And this is one of the parents from narcoleptic children. And it was propagated, especially from authorities, that everyone should vaccinate. And if you didn't, you were lacking in solidarity, and you put not only yourself at risk, but also other people, colleagues, schoolmates. And expressions like, we placed our children on the sacrificial altar so that you all could remain healthy, are used from parents of narcoleptic children. Because from the individual perspective, only vaccinated persons bear the cost of vaccination. And parents with vaccinated children that did not get the side effect, I'm one of those, my children did not get the side effect, uh, could express it like we had the winning lottery ticket. And there are many narratives that point to that people, both during the pandemic but also afterwards, find themselves caught into a war of interpretations. The patients that suffer from narcolepsy without having it from the vaccine are organized in, <clears throat> in the Swedish Organization of Persons with Neurological Disabilities. The special circumstances after the pandemic made it important for the new narcoleptics and the families to find another kind of organization to be able to work on their rights and their special needs. The Association for Narcoleptic Patients started quite soon after the side effect was confirmed, and the association has three big missions. One is to influence researchers and decision makers to find a cure for the disease or a functional treatment. Another mission is to ensure that people suffering from narcolepsy as a side effect from vaccine will have economic compensation. And this is a great fight at the moment. And a third miss mission is to build networks, spread knowledge, and give support to their members. Furthermore, individuals are also working on broad basis to obtain medical expertise and to gain acceptance from the medical community. They get a new relationship to medical facts and many parents of children with narcolepsy have started to learn the language of biomedicine to be able to follow the scientific discussions or to pose relevant questions to the medical experts and to the doctors treating their children. Some have also become activists and much of their work resembled the AIDS activist movement in the 1980s. And these experiences from the AIDS activists' contribution to medical progress is important to remember when it comes to value the public involvement in health concern. They have become expert patients and expert families in, contrib in contributing to knowledge, in putting pressure on politicians and authorities, in monitoring and in surveillance. And this must be seen as valuable inputs in the work to regain trust in vaccination and to pandemic preparedness. And when I analyze the narratives provided in my interviews with the families where children have narcolepsy, I see that they range from having strong elements of anger and political criticism, but also to being very didactic. didactic. That is, narrating how to cope with the disease and what to do about the actual situation. Public health policy concerning influenza treatment remains a delicate balance between what should be done and what can be done. I would claim that the management of influenza, both as seasonal epidemics and even more so as pandemic, still constitutes a wicked problem. 
Historically, there have been many failures in protecting the public and society from influenza pandemics, both because of lack of consciousness of the problem, lack of tools for effective protection, and both political underreacting and overreacting at times. And furthermore, there is a great need of a critical reflexivity among all the political and social institutions involved. This work is about returning back, but also looking forward. What did we know, what could we know, and what will we know? And the experiences from the handling of the swine flu pandemic show the need for a more participatory, prepared implementation when facing pandemics. There is a great demand for dialogue and a need for knowledge that is cultural appropriate, relevant to different communities, and that responds to concerns of specific groups. And the study I mentioned earlier about the reasons not to vaccinate also point to the need that people would like to feel involved in the vaccination enterprise to make a sensible decision regarding whether their health will be best protected by vaccination. And to accomplish this um, collaboration and dialogues between <coughs> categories involved, whether these represent politics, research, medical staff, pharmaceutical industry, media, anti-vaccination movements, patients or the general public, must be grounded in a fundamental respect for the multiple realities enacted with all their concerns and trust and fears. And this is a quotation from Priscilla Wald. The interactions that make us sick also constitute us as a community. Disease emergence dramatizes the dilemma <clears throat> that inspires the most basic of human narratives, the necessity and danger of human contact. And finally, a short return to my title, The Power of Narratives. What narratives? What kind of power? The swine flu outbreak narrative was very powerful and it was presented globally from WHO and that made governments act. In Sweden, it also worked as a built-in trigger for the purchasing of vaccine. The subsequent reports on deaths throughout the world were indeed also powerful. They made people afraid made media to react very strongly and triggered emotional reactions. In Sweden, narratives were strong about the fear of too little vaccine coming and would all parts of the country get it in time. These narratives made suspicion and conspiracy thoughts grow. So did the narratives about medical researchers working in alliance with the pharmaceutical companies. Later on, we had the narcolepsy nar narratives, often condensed into a picture of a child falling asleep over his or her desk or computer. And later still, we have the narrative that actually there was no pandemic at all. Now maybe there is a risk of forgetting uh, the frightening stories about children dying, about patients being transported to countries that were lucky enough to provide care with ECMO machines. That is why I also find it very important to also gather their narratives, those who were very ill, maybe treated in the ECMO machine, those who lost someone near in the swine flu. We need the whole picture because we will have to go back to it because influenza is still a wicked problem. Thank you for listening. Um, other European countries used the other vaccines like Panenza, which was mm. the French Sanofi mm. vaccine and presumably didn't have these problems. Mm. And I think the United States didn't have no. much of this problem. So uh, two questions. Did they figure out what in the vaccine caused this problem? And two, the American solution would have been to sue everybody, especially <laughs> Smith-Klein, uh, yeah. GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, well, I think that is uh, one of the greatest mysteries for the medical expertise to know what actually happened. Was it the adjuvants? Uh, uh, in the vaccine or is it um, something also to connect it to the virus itself or maybe the timing that we vaccinated m when the virus was coming, the pandemic was coming and we did it at the same time. I, I don't think there is a clear answer to this um, still. Uh, and this um, genetic um, component is very much discussed also but it didn't Everybody with this genetic component did not get narcolepsy, so it's not the whole, uh, whole answer either. But something in the, in the adjuvants, I think, they think it is. And I think the narcoleptic's parents very much would like to sue someone, <laughs> I guess. But um, 
there is a great struggle, political struggle going on from their parts on who, who is to be responsible for this. Is it the government or is it the GlaxoSmithKline or who is it? Or is it the people themselves who had to agree on doing the vaccination? Any other questions? Thank you. I think with any uh, medical intervention, there's a risk and there's a benefit. And I think people probably, when they get the flu vaccination, think I might have a one in a uh, hundred chance of dying of the flu, but mm -hmm. one in a million chance of having some unknown side mm -hmm. effect mm -hmm. to that. But after the bad side effect occurs to you, it's mm -hmm. no longer probability. It's, it's happened to you. And you think, why did I do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But on the global population, it would seem that the next time this occurs, you would still think my chances of yeah. dying versus the chance of the yeah. other thing. Yeah. So uh, hopefully that will not dissuade people from getting uh, vaccinations in the future. Yeah, but yeah, hopefully. But I think it will be hard for Swedish authorities to claim a mass vaccination <laughs> strategy because people are now very, very suspicious. But I think if we have uh, lots of reports on deaths, um, people would line up for, for vaccine. Right, in fact, if there yeah. were none, means that the yeah. vaccination probably worked. So yeah. it's a success yeah, story in a way. Because the it, flu has it, killed more people than any other infectious disease. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it would, and it would not have been possible to test this vaccine to see this, this um, side effect, because you have to have it in such a broad scale to, to have these side effects coming out. But still, it's a tragedy because it has, um, it, it is the young people who suffer from it and the young people were the ones that we wanted to protect from the flu to begin with. Do you have any idea how many children were involved? Are there numbers? Mm, vaccinated. Martin, help me, do you know? <laughs> The number of children in that, those age groups. Oh, sorry. He's he more a medical specialist than yeah, I am. My okay. name is Martin Holmberg, <laughs> and um, I work at the National Board of Health and Welfare, so I was involved during that time. And um, there's an estimated around 200 uh, children that have been, been um, uh, that are deceased with, um, with narcolepsy that v were vaccinated. Uh, around 200 and um, the coverage among young children of those ages was over 60 percent of vaccinated yeah. and also this disposition genetic disposition this uh, HLA types is very common also in Sweden so it's over 25 percent of mm. our population does have that disposition mm. so it's it's a very broad disposition. Mm. And it's the same in Finland also, this genetic thing. I wanted to ask if that, uh, if the potential link to the narcolepsy caused a problem with regular flu vaccine subsequent to that and, and whether the message about getting other kinds of flu shots or other kind of um, vaccinations was changed at all mm -hmm. because of what happened? No, I don't think this has changed the, the communication about the regular flu vaccines because that's, uh, this, uh, that's another vac vaccine and it's not the same adjuvants. And, um, and I think it has um, have really hadn't, hadn't bothered that people vaccinate as little as and, and or as much for the flu seasonal flu as they did before. So they were clear, they clearly understood that there was a difference. Yeah, I think they did. But, but the, the, the vaccine for the seasonal, seasonal flu is also considered very ineffective also. So I think people are in a way, mm, why should I? But Pandemrix was effective, <laughs> really. And, but we, we have not seen anything that it has imposed on children's vaccination. It's still very high. So people still trust children's vaccination. But I think it was this recommendation of a mass vaccination strategy and this uh, solidarity argumentation that really has gone into people's minds and, and got people to feel, oh, 
what, what happened really. Brilliant presentation, um, fantastic. Is anyone working to mediate the narratives between the folks in authority and the people who feel that they've been affected by the mass vaccination and folks who feel disenfranchised or who are disadvantaged um, by this? Is it, are, are Other than uh, uh, academics who are studying it like yourself, which I think is important work, mm -hmm. is there anyone who's working to mediate between the two groups to try to uh, bring this to some sort of closure for people or, or mm -hmm. make sure that all the concerns are voiced and that sort of thing? No, not really, I think, because of that also what I, what I, why I think this research is important, because I like to have a, an arena for, for all these narratives to be discussed at the same time, and we need to have that the next time. But I think the, all the different authorities, they mind their own business. We, we only did these things, and we only did these things. So that, that is not our responsibility. So that we have no real connection. And no, but I think every authority is, is quite worried about what has, what has happened, and, and, and they kind of blame someone else also. Hi, Britta. That was um, terrific. My question is about the conspiracy narratives, mm -hmm. um, because I know that in the years since, there's been quite a lot of work that's been done sh uh, trying to document the, the sort of entanglements between World Health Organization and some of the vaccine manufacturers on the global scale. So I guess my question is, you, you said that it was a common narrative, is one mm. that constantly popped up, and you also said that the families are now experts. Mm. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is, is there concerns about pharmaceutical profits? Is it informed by this sort of academic discussion about some of the the, the financial conflicts of interest that might have been going on at World Health Organization and on the global public health scale, or is it more just sort of a, um, a sort of a, a fear about the pharmaceutical industry and about profits and things like that? I think it's more the latter. Uh, people are not specifically informed, um, and especially these um, parents from narcoleptic children, they, they they try to pick uh, something that they can cling to. And, and this is something they can, can cling to. And, and it could be right, but it, it's too generalized. So that there's also work to be done, I think. Because you have, we have no state, uh, um, state um, production of vaccines in Sweden. We have to rely on the, on the pharmaceutical companies and, and researchers are working with them and not all of them are profit gaining. Or, so it's, this has to be nuanced, I think. Anybody else? Um, you talked about the narratives that have emerged out of the um, interviews you've conducted, and you also mentioned um, early on that the existence of a blogosphere and the existence of uh, rapid communication mm -hmm. played a role here. Yeah. Would you say that there's a, that broadcast media or other forms of major media have developed a dominant narrative or that that has had any influence on how the public has perceived this question? Uh, it's a very good question. I don't, don't know if I can answer it. Um, I think the media during the pandemic was quite pro-authorities. They kind of helped authorities in this and uh, uh, getting, to, getting the mass vaccination to work and getting people in and also quite scary stories reported. Uh, and afterwards it has been um, that the two uh, big newspapers in, in Sweden have opposite uh, stances toward this. One is, was very critical afterwards and one is very positive afterwards. Uh, so um, I think media themselves criticize themselves for not being critical enough uh, for what happened and, and asking to, to, uh, not asking to critical questions during the time when it happened. That is what I've seen. But I think there has to be more research on, on how uh, the in, interplay between social media and, and, and the old media, so to speak, and the interplay with this and, and the narratives from the interviews. Because in a way, there is a, um, you cite one another all the time. I don't know if that was the answer. Mm -hmm. Um, looks like we uh, have finished with the questions. 
So thank you very much, Professor Lundgren.